so we put together that clip. Macy's was recognized in, um, in the fall as marketer of the year by the Direct Marketing Association. And as a part of it, the DMA had asked that we put something together to kind of encapsulate everything we were doing with the use of data and insights and customer analytics and consumer analytics and consumer research to deliver relevancy and to deliver that relevancy in any medium where we really could um, connect on a one-to-one -one basis with the, with the customer. And I remember meeting with our creative team and they had said to me, so what's this little thing gotta be? And I said, it's, 90, it's about a 90 second spot and it needs to be about the analytics, the, the use of our traditional data environment, the use of our big data environment, delivering all these versions, how we connect with the customer. And this is what he came up with. He goes, I don't know how to put together a creative piece around data and analytics. So <laughs> this, this is what we have. But it really, oops, hold on just a second. I wanna move us forward. Can we move us forward, please, in the back? Thank you, there we go. So today I'm gonna to spend a little bit of time speaking to you about the experience we have at Macy's with the use of customer information, as Bob said, to really inform not only marketing in a traditional sense, but starting to think about how customer information can really change our whole mindset about how we run our business. So not only to inform enhanced marketing and advertising techniques, but also how we use it to draw insights that can help us improve the service experience in store, the site experience online, the assortment content, pricing, things of that nature. And I'm gonna take you through our experience for how we use data to inform a customer strategy using data, not just kind of a let's do this. Talk to you about how data informs some customer languages that we're starting to use throughout the business. And then lastly, because everybody hears the customer strategy and they hear about customer languages and customer segments and you say, so what does it all mean and now what do I do with that? I'll take you through some of the activations that we have out in the market today to show you how we're thinking about delivering relevancy. There probably isn't an organization in this room, it doesn't matter what industry you focus on specifically, that doesn't have some sense of this brand value of customers being first. And we're not unlike any of you and other organizations throughout the country with this idea of the importance of putting the customer at the center of all decisions. And in fact, this here is the cover of our company's brand strategy document that we refresh and publish every year. And sure enough, we say we put the customer at the center of all decisions. But for us at Macy's, what we've been trying to do in the past four to five years is to think about that and, and really elevate it beyond the rhetoric, beyond just kind of the, the tagline and say, what are we really doing here? What does it mean to put the customer at the center of all decisions? Point of sale systems have been amazing for the past 20 and 30 years, providing us with deep insights into how many pens I can sell and, and you know, how many clickers I can sell and at what margin and things like that. We've become so product centric because of the data that was being supplied to us by our point of sale systems that we somehow lost sight of the customer. We're a 155 year old retailer we probably had customer centricity embedded in our DNA at some point or else we wouldn't be 105, 155 years old today. But we lost track of the customer and we're inviting her back to the table at Macy's. One of the things that we decided we wanted to do was to not only say customers are first, but to really try to tease out what she needs from Macy's, what she is looking to, what needs she's looking to fulfill at Macy's. And we, it occurred to us that we have an amazing database that has 33 million active households contained within it, 500 million transactions a year. We can match seven out of 10 of our transactions, whether in store or online, to a unique customer. And I know a ton about how she's engaging with Macy's. And it's not just what she's buying at Macy's, but how she's buying it, in what combinations of products, at what price points, her sizes, whether or not she's returning products, how she's using the channels in, in our stores in concert with one another. And all of this different information, if you think about formally organizing around it, can deliver pretty amazing insights. And so we went into both our traditional database, our customer database, as well as new tools that are supporting us in the big data environment with the unstructured volume of data sets that we all have available to us today. And we really decided to think about what a customer strategy would be if I used the customer behavior data to inform who we should be going after and why. And what we learned through this exercise and through this exhaustive study of tapping into our data and really drawing these insights out from it is that we have a multi-billion dollar sales opportunity. Sorry. Can 
you build for me in the back? Thanks. Just by retaining and growing our loyal customers. What we have learned is that we have seven out of 10 American households in our trade areas coming into a Macy's on an annual basis. So seven out of 10. So the opportunity is already in our stores. And for many, many years, our emphasis was definitely on acquisition. It was the big public media campaigns. It was getting a brand TV spot out there, not quite ready for the Super Bowl yet, but putting a lot of that public media out there with the idea of acquisition, getting people off of their couches and into the store. And we learned through this exercise, I already have 70% of my target marketplace coming into the store in the first place. But of those seven, only five of the seven are making a purchase. And only half of them are loyal to Macy's. The great news about those that are loyal to us, though, is that by studying their behavior, the three to five years worth of behavior that I have with them over across channels, I really understood what they were looking for, what types of products they wanted, what price points I needed to deliver. And I could do that for an individual store. I could do it for online. And so we really said, you know what? In terms of a customer strategy, we are going to focus on loving the ones that we're with. We're really going to do everything we can to fiercely focus on loyals. Build, please. Thanks. Then, when we focus on loyal customers and delivering the experiences that they expect based on what we can learn and glean from the, their data and their behavior with us, we have a passive but material benefit on the non-loyals as well, because they'll start to see those improvements in the stores, they see those improvements online, and they react to it in a positive way as well. And then, of course, lastly, number three, thank you, we have the opportunity to finally convert those non-purchasers because they'll see the improvements, they'll see the improvement in product and the communications that they're receiving, and all of it does lead up to this, this customer strategy and this billion dollar opportunity to focus on loyals. So as we were going through this effort, we were really going into all of our data. Sorry, I think we're having some issues here. Sorry, everyone. You can build the second one. And what we learned is we were confusing the organization. For years and years and years, everybody has a unified language. We can all talk about revenue, and we know what that means. We know if it's good or bad, if it goes up or down. We can talk about stock price. I can talk about EBIT. I can talk about margin. And when I mention these types of metrics, everybody immediately, they telegraph immediately whether something is good or not good. But here I was talking about customer information, and no one knew what we were talking about. They were confused. They, I'm talking about loyals and non-loyals. Then I started to talk about customers and their behavior with us. And we were talking about people who were best customers, devoted shoppers, and then practical spenders, and, and all of these types of things. And we said, you know what? Before we get into a lot of the, the tactics and the activations that we can put into the marketplace based on these insights, let's pause and let's try to transition from our customer strategy of fiercely focusing on loyals and transition us into those activations by creating and launching a customer language that we could use throughout the organization for the purpose of unifying us so that when I talk about the business and I talk about the devoted shopper and you know, I lost households of devoted shoppers and premium loyals, that would immediately send a message to people to say, uh-oh, that's a, you know, a problem. I need to do something about that. But if I lost households for the practical spender segment, probably not as worrisome. And it would immediately explain to people what that was about. So the My Customer Loyalty segmentation was put together to really help us measure the progress of the different activations that we have in market. So we have loyal customers and non-loyals, and we break them into sub-segments within those two categories. But the important thing when we're talking about this for our organization is that loyalty to a retail fashion brand is not about how much a customer spends with us. And that was a pretty big aha moment for everybody. It's not about if they spent $10,000 a year at Macy's or if they spent $150 a year at Macy's. It actually has no correlation to retention year over year at all, zero. However, how often a customer visits us has an extremely high correlation with retention year over year. And so it changed again the conversation to say, purchase visits matter, spend doesn't. And that really also started to change the conversation that we were having. And it makes you think differently about what types of activations you need to get out into the marketplace. And then we also put together, as a lot of organizations do, behavior-based segmentation to really give people a sense of who these people are in their real lives. So it's not only a behavioral segmentation of how they engage with Macy's the brand. We put psychographic and attitudinal over, um, overlays onto it so that it really understands how Macy's is interacting with these people in their real lives. But nobody really cared about the customer strategy of focusing on loyals and talking about premium loyal shoppers and the home matters segment and the style seekers and all of that type of thing. We're very much a culture of wanting to get things done. 
And so there was a lot of reporting on the what for who people were in their lives and using this data to, to bring interesting information to people. But there was this, this need for us to move much more quickly and help people understand, so what does it all mean? And now what do I do with it? And so here I'll take you through just a handful of the examples of activations that we have in market for how we're using customer data to deliver relevancy. And to deliver that relevancy, and the examples I'll give you here, really very much as it relates to how I communicate with her. One of the things we are doing related to loyalty is we take the customers and that loyalty segmentation that I briefly mentioned, and we really do understand how loyal she is to Macy's. And we try to deliver a thank you back to the customer. This is one channel where we're testing the use of our point of, point of sale as a channel to, in one example, based on a customer's loyalty segment score in the back end, offer her, in this example, just a coffee. A free coffee on us. Sometimes we offer a manicure. Sometimes it's a lunch on us. It could be lots of different things. But just to say thank you, trying to connect with the customer in that very emotional way where she goes, really, you just, I don't have no strings attached? You're Macy's. You always have coupon exclusions. Is there a coupon exclusion to this thing somewhere? So kind of surprising her a little bit with just this free coffee. But the coffee is assigned to her, certainly, because we know her overall value to Macy's. And again, not just on spend, but also how often she visits with us and across the channels. Then we also start to extend offers to our customers on the products where we can really break through and surprise her with an offer on something that we know she loves that is generally not included in our traditional promotional positioning, and really say thank you to her again. In this example, it's 20 off on a purchase of Tommy Hilfiger. But the idea is that we go through what's happening in the background is we take all 33 million households that are in the database, and we take a pool of 100,000 or so offers, right? So just combinations of a 5% off, 10, 15, 20 dollars off, percents off, against all the 4,000 brands I have. And we come up with a pool of offers between 100 and 150,000 offers can be sitting in this pool, and all of those offers are scored against all customers in the database. And then in this particular example, when I find her at the point of sale, and we scan her credit card in our case, it goes up against a real-time cloud that I have, a cloud environment, to pull down the offers that are waiting for her. So those are the types of things that we're doing. The analytics is driving the action that's then taken in the store, and then our sales associate gets to be the hero and deliver this great experience. This is the piece that was, that's been spoken about a lot in the press. People love to talk about it. Our CEO loved it when we did it. The idea here is to say, in direct mail, we're a very large direct marketer. We have an environment that is set up and a, and a production machine, if you will, to really crank out a lot of versions if we had needed to. And we said, you know, what if we were to do version not just based on climates, you know, putting more swimwear into Florida and putting more coats into the Midwest in the winter and things like that, but what if we were to start to do that same idea of taking for the 4,000, 5,000 brands that we carry in our store and all of that different content and score it based on its statistical relevance to individual customers and then only content a customer's direct mail piece based on the product that scored extremely high from a statistical relevance perspective. So on a scale of one to five, every single bit of content was scored. A customer was only allowed to get content in their book if it had a score of four or five, which meant it was very, very relevant based on their five years of behavior data with us, our analysis. If it was a one, two, or three, we considered it clutter, and it was not permitted to go into their book. And the very first time we tried this, we actually, based on this whole methodology, we produced 665 unique versions of a catalog employing this kind of idea of only serving up the relevant content. The performance on that first book was so impressive to us that we actually started, and we just did that based on the content that had already been shot for that book. We went out and we were telling our merchants, I need you to submit more product. We need to shoot more content because I need to have more content in this pool that I can score and include in future customers' books. So then we got up to 4,700, 7,000, 15,000. Everyone loves to hear about the 200,000, the 500,000 unique versions. And they are impressive because we were actually adding in content and it was only the content that we thought that would be relevant for those customers. The customers that participated in this, we delivered relevance to them for a year. It was a longitudinal study. So the results kept getting better. Because the first couple of times, it's hit or miss that she even opened her mail that week, right? So we didn't know if it was, you didn't quite get the lift yet. But over time, she can start to tell something different is happening to me at Macy's. Macy's is definitely a little bit more relevant. And we saw the lift and there it's, very impressive. <laughs> I, you know, not at liberty to really share the exact sales 
results that we experienced, but it was enough to make us say that we were onto something and that relevancy works. The unfortunate part here is that we were doing this in print and it was extremely expensive. Um, not only was the operation expensive from digitizing all of our assets and whatnot, we were willing to make those investments, but paper got very expensive. You were single binding books, postage went through the roof. So um, we were kind of winning on the effectiveness side, but losing on the efficiency side. So what we have done with the methodologies here, we're still doing a small degree of this in the print space, not at the level of the 500,000 unique versions, particularly because of those. We, we had 75,000 households receive an individual piece of mail that had been custom printed just for them. Um, you start to get into a place of, is the juice worth the squeeze <laughs> to really print 75,000 custom books for people? So we have taken the methodologies we're employing here, the people that we have assigned to all of this work, and we're redeploying them, as you would expect, into the digital arena. So let's talk about that a little bit. First of all, personalization, when you hear about it, and a lot of us read about it, where it's Dear Julie, that's table stakes. You should just be doing that. Um, but it doesn't necessarily drive material and impressive lift. It's really more about the relevant content, the relevant offer, the relevant timing of when these things show up for a customer. And it doesn't always have to be as precisely targeted as I think when people have heard our story, they're thinking, oh, it, it, it's you know, a statistical score of this five and whatever we're doing internally. Sometimes just including localized content breaks that relevancy barrier and it says, okay, they know me. Here's a map in the phone and address of my local store. I just want to point here. Um, when you look right here on this, this piece here. And the personalized name piece of it definitely needs to be there. But it's more than that. So we're using the data in the back end, and we're starting to do a lot more testing in the space of using an insight to then inform an action. So in the world of e-commerce, everybody knows we're all doing these types of things with changing out site pages, landing pages, and how you navigate through the site using data. But what we're doing is we try to find a simple insight to then inform exactly what happens on site. So here's an example of one. We all know, we've heard about this, it's not just a Macy's reality, but the customer who shops both in-store and online is far more valuable than a customer who only shops in-store or only shops online. In fact, for us, the one who shops online is the most valuable. The one who only shops in-store is second most valuable. If they shop only online, they're actually extremely low value to us. So we decided to say, what are the behaviors we can see? What does it seem to be, you know, what are the, the um, nuances of a customer that shops online and stays both online and in-store? And the tendencies and like the last behavior that we see in-store that appears to be a trigger for the next engagement to be an online purchase that then thereafter keeps the customer in both channels. So kind of complex if you stayed with me on that, but really trying to understand the migration from in-store to online and then the stickiness that keeps you in both places. And we found we have a couple of categories that consistently appear to be the gateways to an omnichannel consumer. And I can't say what the categories are, but I will tell you that when we trigger and I see a customer in store and she has done a certain behavior with one of these categories, if I trigger a certain type of communication to her, I have a very good likelihood of getting her to convert and shop online. And the best part about it is when I then wait a certain period and trigger a next communication to her in a certain very orderly way, I can keep her to go back into the store, which creates that omni-channel consumer, which is what we seek. So we're using the insight to create a communication strategy delivering relevance to the customer where we get the behavior we seek. So we're doing it in a very intended way to drive that behavior. From a cross-category shopping perspective, here in the middle, everybody has recommendation engines, so obviously we can all do all of this customization with our recommendation engines. And again, it's kind of table stakes. What's a little bit different here, I may still have a company message that we're in home sale. So the home group is gonna get the whole center stage here. What I then do though, is I'll change out secondary placement, and here it happens to say handbags for one customer. For another customer, it may say shoes. For another customer, it may say beauty. For another customer, it may be mattresses. We can then switch out kind of secondary positions and secondary banners to really deliver relevancy again so that the, the, the brand message is that we're having a home sale. That will still stay in place but I can deliver relevancy using the data for that particular customer in the background. And then, of course, we always want to be doing more with product recommendations to deliver relevancy again when the customer comes on site. But what's different is a lot of these engines that are out there do some pretty basic kind of trigger-based business rules of if a customer searches Michael Kors, you know, perhaps they assume it's apparel that she's looking for, and so the next thing that shows up is a bunch of Michael Kors apparel, the new collection, men's, women's, whatnot. 
But what if, when customers actually search on Michael Kors, their next purchase is a Bar 3, it's a private brand, Bar 3 handbag? So, and that there's a stronger correlation between that activity. So the, the recommendation engines that we're employing are being refined to really tease out more nuanced insights about the customer behavior so that for that particular customer, what shows up in the recommendation engine is a little bit more sophisticated than some of the really basics, others like you, and things of that nature. And of course, as everyone would expect, just to kind of sum up, we're doing a lot of this, having all of these custom offers created for customers, all of this custom content sitting there ready to deliver. Certainly the idea is to be able to deliver it to her wherever she is. So with SMS and with wallets, whether it be in partnerships with Apple Passbook and Google Wallet and ISIS and Foursquare and all those different folks, really making sure that if I'm gonna to go to all the effort of having the analytics group put together all of this custom content and these, these custom offers for our customers, that when I can find her, I'm always delivering relevance. That to the extent that I know her, and of course she has opted in in a privacy compliant way, I can deliver those very targeted relevant offers. That's like a disclaimer for the legal folks that are around. Um, and if not, maybe deliver her a store-wide, you know, the, the traditional store-wide message that we would have as, as a part of our overall high, you know, high level architecture. So these are just a sampling of the types of things that we're doing, but the big message is definitely that relevancy does count. It delivers the sales that you're gonna be asked to sign up for from an investment perspective, and it really will allow you to validate the, and to provide um, evidence of the ROI associated with these investments. And the great news is, today, we can measure all of this. So I can do what I mentioned as it relates to online migration, and I really can then afterwards say, I did this to a customer because I think I can get her to convert and shop online, and sure enough, did she? And we can see all of that, and we can track it when we leverage our environments to, to really you know, empower us with these insights. So it's really just in 20 minutes, it's a lot of information to absorb. I hope that it gives you, you know, some things to think about. I'm happy to, throughout you know, the day, um, answer any specific questions that people may have about some of the nuances of all of this. But now, I'm also happy to answer any questions from the group. Oh, I was asked last minute to add things that I learned. <laughs> Sorry, forgot about that. A couple things that I will close with before I open it up for questions. One of the things is that you definitely need to have the perseverance to make the call for change stick. You know, there are a lot of organizations, again, we're 155 years old, we have a lot of things that we want to do the way we've always done them. Customer information half of the time affirms the very hypotheses that people have always had are, are in fact correct. The other half of the time I'm myth busting. The other half of the time, I'm telling people that their children are ugly, and they don't like hearing that. And so you need to deliver these conflicting messages that are grounded on a, an insight truth in a way that is kind and generous, and help people to kind of get there on their own. The second thing is that you really need to be prepared to have the right resource expertise within your organization. A lot of organizations have grown up around with an analytical mindset, um, but they, what that really means is that they report on data. They can download data from whatever environment they have into an access database, pull it into Excel, throw it into a pivot table, and create a PowerPoint out of it. But we really have a need to hire more people that are thinkers, that know how to synthesize that data and actually study it and analyze it and have a point of view about it and come up with an action. So think about the resources that you have within your organization and whether or not they're qualified and ready to do this type of work. You need to challenge your existing workflows and processes. The way that you've always done things has to be changed. We eventually are all going to need, in our case, to digitize every bit of content so that we can and have better attribution on it so that I can take a lot of what today is a manual process and automate the assembly of all of this relevancy for our consumers in a much more seamless way. There is the reality check of costs, so you need to make sure that within the organization as a part of this change conversation, you're not just the person up there saying, let's use customer data, have a customer strategy and languages and activations, but ensure that you're sensitive to the realities of the ROI that now, especially in marketing, we know we can measure all of this, so start to have those types of conversations and talk about the measurement and our commitment to signing up for sales. And then the last thing is speed. I think a lot of times in this world of this customer analytics place, people are just in this perpetual state of study, and it's almost becoming very academic as if we're like permanent professors that never kind of do, but we just talk. Um, we gotta do something. We're still here to run a business. We're still here. I'm, we're a public company. I have shareholders that we, have to be meeting their, their expectations for performance. So get far enough to have an insight, but don't wait until it's perfect. 80% is close enough, just go. Start getting some things out there and, and get some activation, start measuring, start making mistakes, 
start screwing it up. Trust me, we've had a lot of things we've done where we didn't understand the why of why customers weren't behaving the way we thought for sure they would. So we did do some traditional qualitative to you know, understand the why. And um, you know, it's amusing. You see it and you're like, duh. We spent a little bit too much time sitting with the SaaS folks instead of um, you know, really thinking about the customer. So keep that kind of balance of the, the art and the science and, and just get moving. Um, and with that, I will open it up to questions. Julie, that was outstanding. It's thank you. It's a lot you. in 20 minutes. Sorry, no, everyone. No, no, it's great. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for sharing all the insights. And it's been said that um, finding an idea is genius, but selling an idea is a miracle. And uh, you've done some miraculous things. Uh, I'm curious, what was the biggest roadblock that you faced as, as you brought all of this new thinking forward? Because this is all really breakthrough stuff. Can you talk about any of the roadblocks that you faced or any of the things that you had to overcome? Sure. I, I do think it's harkening back to what I briefly mentioned. It's the comfort zone of the historical way of how people have always done stuff. And it's a personal pet peeve of mine for someone to say, we tried that in 1999 and, or but, you know, that type of thing. Let so me be the devil's advocate. Right. That's my <laughs> so you really have to, you do have to persevere. You have to have patience. You have to just keep on going. It is going to be a scenario if you really are trying to change a culture to go from product centric to customer centric. You're going to have the two steps backwards before you move forward, and that's okay. But I will say one of the things, and you know, everyone always loves to say you need to have senior management support, and it feels like it's rhetoric. In my case, it definitely is true that you need it. And the first year, we were not that successful with getting people to put the customer at the center, literally, reserve a seat at the table for her, ensure that the conversation was revolved around really what need state we were filling for her. And I was asked by our CEO what I needed in terms of help, how could he support me. We had a whole bunch of conversations about things. The bottom line was I needed a sponsor. That afternoon, he removed the title chief executive officer from his door, and he put up a new nameplate that said chief customer officer, and he announced it on an analyst call unscripted, which you can imagine how that made our CFO feel, to have a CEO saying something in an unscripted way as a public company. <laughs> but it changed the dynamic overnight. And you really do need to have that person be inspired by the idea and have passion around it to help you, you know, really create a movement. Great, thank you. We have a question from the floor. Oh, hi, Ian from CrowdTap. Um, I was just curious how branding fits into all this because I didn't hear a lot of talk of the correlation between whether it's TV spots or regionalized TV spots or if we, you know, do things that correlate with branding efforts or using this data to then influence branding. I was just curious the, the perspective there. Okay, sure. So almost all of the above. First of all, branding is still important. The, the brand still, you know, the whole Budweiser Clydesdale thing, that, that was beautiful. And it helps you telegraph what that brand stands for at a kind of higher level to envelop the whole experience then around product and price and, and experience and whatnot. Brand is still very important. And there are certain messages that we do want all of our customers to experience around our brand to kind of show really the fundamental positioning of Macy's that we perceive for them in their lives. The relevancy piece is important, so there is always this kind of um, balancing act you have to play between the brand message, the traditional promotional messaging, and then the delivery of this kind of relevancy and this, this custom content and custom offer piece. We are constantly playing around with and testing what, you know, how to strike that right balance. Um, we also use customer data to inform brand positioning and to use some brand trackers and things of that nature to still monitor kind of the pulse of the customer and, and have a health check on the brand as well. So customer information doesn't only have to be about using customer to inform the relevant content and to inform assortment changes and things of that nature. Customer and consumer insights can still support kind of how we think about the brand um, and bring that to bear. And it's really thinking about almost ideally having eventually a customer communications plan where I take an individual customer and I come up with that perfect ideal state of I would like Julie to receive this in a catalog, this on email, this out in the online di you know, display space, and really come up with a communications plan that's custom for that customer. Certainly for TV, we will get to the place where I will start working, as we're doing in, in the online space with display, taking a media publisher's data, matching it with my PII in a safe haven, privacy compliant manner, and actually deliver the exact ad I want to that particular media publisher's, um, you know, when they show up on, on a particular site. So we're doing a lot of that testing right now as well. And the results of that type of online behavioral targeting using the in-store and online purchase behavior 
creating content for individual people that we want them to see when they're out on our partners' um, properties has been amazingly successful. And we fully intend to put more and more of our um, ad spend in, into that space. I hope that answers your question. Another question from the floor. Hi, Mark Silva from Rise. And um, first of all, I th uh, first a comment, I think you're a radical. Uh, in, in a world of retailers, uh, even in the Macy culture, but I'm sure in retail in general, uh, the merchandiser sort of wins every single argument, mm -hmm. and somehow you're radicalizing that through data, which is just mm -hmm. mind-blowing to me. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, we're talking about moments of truth, and those moments aren't just advertising moments. They're also where consumers are engaging either around your brand or actually in your store or heading to your store. So can you talk about how you guys are looking at mobile and how that's going to be radicalizing. You've already seen the data, obviously, about how they're, they're consuming, but how are you guys looking at mobile to go to market and tap into these moments of truth? Mobile is a key part of our overall strategy as an organization, and we think about it in a lot of different ways. It is a shopping enabler to enable shopping. It provides information to the customer. It can be a marketing vehicle. So you really have to think about the, and then there's always the device, right? So what does mobile mean? There's the big debate, smartphones versus tablets and laptops and what's mobile and what does she use in what context and all of those different things. So we have been, we, we track a lot of the performance we can already see on mobile devices. We have religion around our customer database. If cus new customer data are created in any environment, it has to come back into the master customer environment so we can study the behaviors, these new behaviors, and become ever more educated. So while it's very top of mind, and it is a part of conversations we're having all the time, anything I would say about mobile today, I'd almost want to reserve the right to say something differently a year from now, because we are studying the different behaviors as the consumer is using these different devices in different ways, and we're modifying our approach and our activations and tactics accordingly. Um, so it's really not just kind of one thing, other than mobile is very important. Thank you very, Anything very else? much, Julie.